Hi, I'm Cease. And I'm Ollie. And, and we, we are Ocean, Ocean Vancouver. Vancouver. And this is episode one. one. Did you know that Lost Lagoons is a really strong history with our local indigenous people? Well, our friend Cease is going to tell us all about it. Hath squail eich tenoyup, toits tenat quien quen shaman. Cease is my nickname, and I'm standing at this beautiful saltwater marsh known as Lost Lagoon, and. It was about in the 1930s when the uh, roadway was being built into the park and so uh, the area we know as the beginning of the causeway that now blocks off this pool of water from the ocean is, uh, is now the Stanley Park Causeway. And it was built, like I said, in the 1930s and at that point, this little area had filled in, it was a tidal pool at the time, and a true saltwater marsh. And then they built the causeway and it cut it off from the rest of the ocean. And so this is Lost Lagoon. It is at the very edge of where my family lived from 1860 to about, probably just before this was built in the 1920s, our family left Kanaka Ranch, which is at Coal Harbor. So Coal Harbor filters into what is now Lost Lagoon, a former tidal zone, tidal pool, and it's still somewhat of a saltwater marsh. It has a riparian zone here. There are cottonwoods, there are uh, red oozier dogwood, also known as red willow. There are thimbleberries and uh, a number of different plants, cedars and firs and hemlocks, uh, alders, maples. Those are amongst some of our usual suspects that you find in the riparian zones of the Pacific Northwest Coast. And yeah, so I have a strong attachment to this pool of water because my family witnessed the changes of it going from a tidal pool to becoming what is known as Lost Lagoon. And so I wanted to share this story with you and share this beautiful space. And you can see that we're on the very edge of the downtown core of what is now known as Vancouver and what the Skomish Ochamea refer to as Kom Komalai. And Kom Komalai means large grove of beautiful maple trees. And so, yes, I'm standing in Stanley Park at Lost Lagoon and I'm thinking about place names in Stanley Park, like Chaithus. Chaithus is what we referred to as most of this peninsula that is now known as Stanley Park. And there are many village sites that we as Omish people and the Huamathguiam and the Tisleiwatuth, our neighbors, we all collectively shared the space, which our people, the Omish people, referred to as Chaithus. And there, in fact, are many pathways in this park that people still use today, like Lover's Lane. And there's another one that goes up uh, from what I call Huai Huai. And Huai Huai is the village that's close to the aquarium. And it is where the Squai Squai dancers, the mask dancers, who are very sacred, lived and uh, worked collectively together to learn how to be the best spiritual ceremonial dancers that they could be and they are very close to another site called Achoch. Achoch is where Beaver Lake is today 
And then there's the one we call papayak, and papayak means elbow. That's why I brought my elbow up. So I'm currently still learning a lot of the different names, place names of the, the sites around what is currently known as Vancouver. And just to note that indigenous people never see those village sites as gone. The, the buildings may not be there, but we see the genetic memory on the landscape and we have the stories that are not that far from that point of contact. In fact, I am six generations away from the, uh, the point in time when the Skomish and Hawaiian families joined in our family and where we had no last name and then we were given the last name Nahaini. It was edited from the uh, the city archives from Nahinu to Nahaini. So we see a lot of changes that have happened over time and how, you know, people change things because they can't say something, it becomes too hard. And that was the way life was in the 1800s and early 1900s. But in the millennial time, I find it very exciting because people of all cultures want to know the real true names of places so they can refer to them in that way. So we're at the entrance of what is now known to our people and always has been known as Chai Thus, but as you all might know as Stanley Park and Lost Lagoon. The Lost Lagoon is absolutely stunning and it is the home of many, many, many living things. In fact, the Lost Lagoon has many ecosystems. And do you guys know what an ecosystem is? Well, an ecosystem is when lots of living things, such as plants or animals, get together along with the weather, the landscape, abiotic things, bionic things to form a bubble of life. Seas will tell us all about the amazing ecosystem that you can find here at the Lost Lagoon. And, <laughs> so I'm coming to you live from this beautiful section of, uh, of the saltwater marsh known as Lost Lagoon. And as you can see around me, we have all kinds of uh, fowl, otherwise known as bird life. Uh, floating around, they're landing, they're taking off, they're doing all kinds of things. And what's special about this little saltwater marsh is the plant life provides hiding and nesting areas for a lot of these birds. It also feeds the oxygen and, and helps to maintain somewhat a cleanliness element of the, water, of the waterways here. And this actually extends from one part of the peninsula to the other and is a, a loose, it, it's not a river, it's not a stream, but it is a saltwater marsh. I'm gonna keep bringing it back to that because the riparian zones that you find these plants in and this animal life, it's all gonna be similar wherever you go throughout the Pacific Northwest coast. You're gonna find cedars and fir trees, hemlocks, alders, maples. And on this zone, we see a lot of berry plants like thimbleberries and salmon berries. There are red oozier, also known as red dogwood or red willow. There are um, a number of other plants, cattail rushes, and all these, all these plants, as I said, contribute to uh, an ecosystem environment that is suitable for birds and uh, small creatures. And in this park, we find raccoons and squirrels. There are also in little mud puddles or big mud puddles around on the trails. There are, are wet zones that are known to house 
uh, the Pacific Northwest Coast Shrew. And I say they're known to because they're tiny creatures and they're super shy. And pretty much all the marine biologists I've spoken to in this park have told me they've never seen one, but they know they're there. So they keep an eye out and keep those wet zones protected so people aren't tromping through them too much and so that they're safe enough to come out during the nighttime and do their their wanderings around collecting food and uh, exploring the the world above where they live and for here it's it's wonderful the different types of ducks that we see and uh, bird life there are swans and uh, the Canadian ducks and Canadian geese there are also different types of wood ducks that have all naturalized here not really sure how some of them got here but you know birds have wings and ships sail and <laughs> migration happens not only with the human world but with the animal world and I think that what's exciting about this is how we are here in this urban environment yet we're uh, being able to on a daily basis uh, bear witness to the the goings-on of animals like ducks and geese and herons of course herons are very prominent around here when we're lucky we get to see ravens and eagles we're pretty urbanized here so we're not always lucky enough to see those birds we see a lot of crows and the crows are are some of them are migratory semi-migratory and some of them are stationary if they have young ones which happens mostly in the spring and summer they'll nest and stay there but there's daily occurrences in our skies across the greater Vancouver Regional District of the murder of crows that fly. I've literally in a day been in sunset uh, in West Vancouver and then I had to drive to Surrey and through that journey I followed the crows. So I know they have an interesting migration and it usually as, the, as dusk is getting early and setting in you start to hear them and see them. But in an environment like this, these are all birds that stick to this area. They have nests, they raise their little ones. When people are lucky, they get to see the ducklings and goslings and, you know, they can sit and observe that while it's all going on. It's kind of an exciting part of, of this area and it makes the downtown part of a city like this so much more comforting and warming to be able to not only look and visit an ecosystem and see the plants but be able to see animals. Uh, we also see turtles in the little um, red striped turtles in this beautiful lagoon. So there's a lot of life brimming here despite the urbanization and how things have been changed over the last hundred years. However, animals are resilient and these animals have chosen to stay and it's been very worthwhile for both human and animal populations alike. Did you guys know that CIS is our indigenous plant diva? That's right, now CIS is going to tell us how indigenous people used to live here use trees and plants as part of their lifestyle. So today we are wandering around in this beautiful forest, again known as Chai Thus or Stanley Park. And I'm standing in a grove of cedars. And the word for cedar in my language is haipe. So I'm here in this, this uh, gathering of haipe. And cedars are the tree of life. They are the most important tree in all of Pacific Northwest Coast people's lives. And why that is, is because they provide us with clothing and transportation and housing. So we use them for everything. We use the root systems. The roots can be gathered in strips to be soaked and made into beautiful baskets that we carry with us. The boughs can be laid down in our homes to, uh, to give some padding between the earth and our feet, but they also keep out bugs. So they're one of the best bug-proof sources in nature. Cedar is very protective, it's resilient. The bark, when you harvest it, it can, you can build a hat, you can create a hat with that, weaving it, 
and that hat could last you about a hundred years or more. The, the park that we're in, Stanley Park, as I said, is also known as Chai Thus. And this entire park was filled with ancient cedars upon contact over 200 years ago with European culture. And so it, be, un, it was sadly uh, mowed down very quickly and all these big cedars were chopped down. And there are scars throughout this forest of those giant cedars that were once here. And you would need 40 kids with their arms stretched out to get around one tree. So the cedars that I'm standing next to are under 150 years old. And I can probably get my arms around most of them, but that's totally amazing that they are still growing. And looking at these cedars, what I imagine is that I could come and peel some bark. And when I gather that, that bark up and I let it sit for a year so that it can release toxins. It's, cedars are full of different volatile oils and that's what protects them and is also what uh, we protect ourselves with as a result. So making cedar hats, making cedar capes, using cedar and mountain goat wool, we can protect ourselves. I think I'm being surrounded by little raccoons here. <laughs> <laughs> yep, there's a few little suspects. They're coming to say hi to me. I had to clap because they are going after my things. <laughs> there they go. They, we thought they left, <laughs> but they are still here. So yeah, so I want to just talk about how cedars are one of those amazing plants that connect the ocean to the forest. And for many reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, they need nutrients to grow for all those hundreds of years. And one of the m richest sources of nutrients for cedars is actually salmon, uh, shells, shellfish, the meat from shellfish, and even the shells themselves. So you will often, uh, when walking in forests, find shells and it's like, how did that get here? Well, a raven or eagle or crow or a seagull could have been flying and dropping them. There are often ravens that do this. They, they know the trick is to drop them into hard surfaces like rocks and uh, even the earth and sometimes the root systems of beautiful cedar trees. So then those fragments of shells get left in the ground and they start to feed the earth where those trees are growing and help them to grow bigger and stronger. And there has been scientific data that proves that salmon and cedars are connected because having extracted some uh, elements of the bough of cedar and studied, scientists discovered that in fact there was salmon DNA found in an ancient 900 year old cedar tree in Haida Gwaii. And through that we understand the connection between the ocean and the forest and how indigenous people have been stewards and uh, observing nature for centuries and we understand this direct relationship between the ocean and the forest. They both need each other to connect and as indigenous people living in these forests for centuries we have had to learn how to adapt and, and how do we stay warm and dry in the winters and I think anybody that's lived in Vancouver for a short time, even in the winter and fall, they start to understand that it rains a lot here. It rains and rains from pretty much October to, to May. And how did our people, like less than 100 years ago, live in longhouses in this very park when we didn't have stores to go buy our clothes in? We had to make everything. We had to gather the roots from the cedar, the bark from the cedar, we had to go into the mountains in the summer and collect mountain goat wool off of bushes where the mountain goats are walking through. And through all of those elements of gathering, we have learned how to combine these beautiful materials and make amazing, beautiful uh, clothing that is weather appropriate, but also really comfortable and sustainable. I think that's the main thing I want to get across here is how sustainable indigenous technology has been over several centuries. 
of observation. And so anybody can be just as observant as my ancestors have been, where they can go into the forest and observe where things come from and how they've uh, arrived here and how we use these materials collectively to create clothing and housing that sustains itself for centuries. Well, that was such a wonderful tour of the Las Lagunas. what do you think? I thought it was brilliant. It was really fantastic. We got to interact with wildlife and different elements of what exists on the riparian zones, which are the plant life and the animal life. And, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful day. What I really loved to learn about was when you talked about how the ocean was connected to the ecosystems here in the Lost Lagoon. That was amazing. Yeah. But you know what would be really, really amazing? Is if we hear from you guys, because we would love to see your art. And it could come in any form. It could be audio clips, could be video clips. What else can they send? Well, they can send a painting, a poem, or anything they would like, basically, because your art is your art, and we will not judge any of your artwork. Yeah, we're excited to, to read and listen and observe the elements that you observe, either in this environment at Stanley Park, Lost Lagoon, or a place like this that, you know, you find riparian plants and you find the type of wildlife we shared with you today, so... Until then, we will see you very soon for Module 2, where we're going to learn way more about the history of the Pacific Ocean and of the indigenous people living on this land. White math, white chakwa, just letting you know we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you so much.